Welcome to Context TV. Today we are at the Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Our guest today is Sarah Roy. Sarah Roy is a senior research scholar at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. She's one of the leading researchers on the Gaza Strip, Palestinian politics in the occupied territories, and on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Her family was murdered in the Holocaust. Only her parents survived in the Nazi extermination camps in Auschwitz and Chelmno, also known as Kulmhof in Poland. Sarah Roy, it's a great pleasure to have you. What is the situation like for Palestinians living in Gaza and the West Bank? You have traveled to Gaza and the West Bank several times and uh, have done a lot of field work over there. What have you learned? From the time that I began my research in 1985 through to today, I can tell you unequivocally that the situation for Palestinians living there and in the West Bank as well uh, ha is extremely adverse. It has deteriorated dramatically. Over time, uh, the occupation, Israeli occupation, has become much more repressive, uh, much more uh, uh, violent in that sense, if one defines violence not only as uh, uh, guns and uh, uh, attacks, but also defined as uh, the denial of rights denial of political rights, the denial of economic rights, the theft of land, the theft of water, the destruction of homes, um, the uh, destruction of uh, an economy, uh, the denial of uh, the right of people to work and earn a living and provide for their families and their children, and to live with any kind of uh, dignity. Um, conditions today in Gaza are as bad as I've ever seen them. And the West Bank, too, has declined quite dramatically. In fact, in a, a World Bank report that I cited in one of my articles recently, I think it was a report from 2011, uh, the World Bank referred to the Gaza as, uh, I believe, I hate to, I, I don't want to misquote, but basically as an imprisoned island and the West Bank was a fragmented archipelago. And that's, in effect, what it is. And one of the most harmful measures that have shaped Palestinian life in the West Bank and Gaza over the last 20 years or so uh, has been the separation of the territories and the isolation of Gaza from the West Bank and from Israel itself. And this was a very clear and deliberate uh, policy initiative of the whole Oslo process to separate out the territories, to separate them, to isolate Gaza, to fragment the West Bank, and uh, to uh, uh, turn the West Bank into a series of disconnected cantons. So when you, when you divide territory that way and you break up The, the collective, uh, you eliminate any geographical basis for a Palestinian economy. You also destroy any sense of a national collective or political um, collective. And in this, the Israeli authorities have been very effective. And this has been extremely damaging. I mean, Oslo, uh, from the beginning, uh, was... Uh, was a very damaging process. Many people didn't see it that way at the beginning. Some of us did. For those of us who actually read the agreements, it was very clear that they did not represent a departure from the past or an end to occupation, but a continuation of that occupation, albeit in a somewhat different form. Uh, so what we see today really is the logical and tragic outcome of 20 years of Oslo, which aimed to, as I said, divide Palestinians internally, separate Gaza from the West Bank, isolate Gaza, and uh, give Israel uh, majority control over the West Bank. There was this disengagement policy, but you're saying that this actually worsened the situation in Gaza. First of all, 
Israel disengaged in the sense that it withdrew the army from within, inside Gaza, and it certainly removed the settlements, which in and of itself is a good thing, of course. But what happened was the Israeli authorities maintained total control over Gaza. So they gave up all responsibility, but maintained complete control. So they control the borders, they control the sea, they control the air, uh, they control the population registry. And when you control the borders, you control the economy, and you control people's livelihoods and their ability to, to live and function normally. Uh, the withdrawal from Gaza, or the disengagement from Gaza, also was meant to solidify Israeli control over the West Bank and to concentrate those settlers uh, that left Gaza in settlements in the West Bank, but also, more importantly, to solidify their control over the West Bank by claiming that they gave back territory, they gave up land uh, to the Palestinians, uh, which is, in effect, what did not happen. To the contrary, Gaza remains, as I said, under full Israeli control, and uh, um, the occupation continues. Israel continues to be an occupier of Gaza, even though they claim that uh, that that is not the case because of their withdrawal. Occupation is defined as effective control in international law. And uh, the fact that Israel can uh, control the economy and trade with Gaza is one of many, many illustrations of continued control over the territory. And it's been extremely damaging to the Gaza Strip, to people's livelihood. And of course, after Hamas won the elections in 2006, uh, it was much easier to justify, not only uh, by Israel, but by the international community, particularly Western donors, it was easier, much easier for them to justify the isolation, marginalization, and criminalization of the Gaza Strip and to implement policies that were meant to uh, punish people. It was a form of collective punishment. It was explained as um, it was explained as a policy that would encourage people in Gaza to overthrow or to rise up against the Hamas regime, which was ludicrous to begin with. But nonetheless, it was aimed at uh, punishing Palestinians there for electing Hamas. Uh, and uh, it was an attempt, of course, to overthrow the Hamas uh, regime. And it was also meant to demonstrate to Palestinians that if they behave, quote unquote, properly, if they, in effect, do what Israel and the West want them to do, they will be rewarded as Palestinians were in the West Bank, or as I should say, the Ramallah based government was. And so you had a situation where the international community uh, was engaging in a process of criminalizing and punishing the Gaza Strip and people there, and rewarding uh, the regime, the Palestinian regime, uh, in the West Bank. And the idea was, and, and there were many statements to this effect, um, the idea was that if people in Gaza see that they will be much better off if they withdraw their support from Hamas and, and um, uh, give it to Abbas and, and his, his government, then they will be rewarded. And again, again, a very insulting, not to, to mention silly and ludicrous approach. As you said, the West Bank is uh, called an archipelago. So why is that and what does it mean? One of the, uh, the terms of the Oslo Agreements was to cantonize the West Bank, to divide the West Bank into areas A, B, and C. And again, I would like to say that all of this information, all of this, everything I'm saying, all of the data I'm providing, which is just touching you know, the tip of the iceberg, is available. There is a huge body of literature on everything I am saying from a variety of sources. Uh, international agencies, World Bank, IMF, all kinds of 
uh, financial institutions, Israeli sources, Palestinian sources, European sources. So if people want to educate themselves on these issues, the, the material is there. Of course, there's nothing like going there and seeing it for yourself to really understand the impact that it has on, on people's lives. But what it is is divide, taking the West Bank and dividing it into different uh, areas. Area A was under full Palestinian control, which again is somewhat of a misnomer because nothing there is completely under uh, independent Palestinian control. But area A, is ref area A referred to the cities, the main cities in the West Bank. And Area B was um, shared uh, civilian control. The Palestinians had civil control. The Israelis had security control. And Area C, which occupies 60 percent um, or so of the West Bank, is under complete and total Israeli control. So you think of it uh, as a piece of Swiss cheese, OK? So you have holes. And the holes, some of the holes, or many of the holes, are under Palestinian control. And the area between the holes are under Israeli control. I mean, that's a, somewhat of a simple oversimplification, but conceptually, I think it's a it's a um, it's a way of helping people understand what that means. So, in effect, it doesn't really matter how many holes the Palestinians may control. What matters is the movement between the holes, which they don't have much control over. So what you have is a series of little cantons or enclaves. And by one count, um, and I, I forget the source, it was an international NGO, uh, but they, they estimated that there were 227 enclaves, little cantons that Palestinians live in. And so what this means is that people have, um, uh, people are confined to varying degrees to these holes, to these areas. Their ability to move from point A to point B is difficult, in some cases restricted. And the majority of the West Bank is under full Israeli control, to which Palestinians have no access or highly restricted access, if you're talking about the Jordan Valley. So it's a situation where people are increasingly confined to smaller and smaller amounts of land. You know, I have friends who live in the northern part of the West Bank. And for them to travel from the north to the southern West Bank is very difficult. It's extremely difficult. And so many of them decide that they don't want to move from point A to point B because they have no guarantee that they're going to get there. They waste a lot of time. And more importantly, they waste a lot of money trying to move, because they have to go through a series of checkpoints. It's not always, uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to you know, successfully get through those checkpoints. There are certain areas from which they're barred. There are, you know, there's a whole uh, settlement infrastructure in the West Bank. Besides the settlements, you have a road system to which, that connect settlements to each other. And Palestinians cannot drive on these roads, or in some cases have restricted access to these roads. Uh, so it is, it is a, a situation where, day by day, the encroachment on Palestinians grows greater and greater. I mean, the settlements are expanding. Uh, the infrastructure that goes along with those settlements is also expanding. And the ability of Palestinians to live and work on their own land has decreased very dramatically. And of course, you also have the separation wall uh, that weaves through the West Bank as well. And if this wall were meant as a security border, uh, it would run along the green line between the West Bank border, the West Bank's border with Israel. But it doesn't. It juts into the West Bank, and the the wall is a land grab. It's an attempt to, de facto, annex as much Palestinian land on the Israeli side of the wall, uh, as as they can, and so Palestinians are increasingly forced to live in smaller and smaller areas. They are cut off, in many cases, from access to their agricultural land. Uh, you know, Pal there are many situations where Palestinians live on one side of the wall, and their land, which they farmed for generations or for many, many years, is on the other side of the wall. And uh, in some cases, you know, the, they have access 
on certain days, certain times, which is, again, not always guaranteed. But of course, it changes the whole, um, it changes the whole framework in which people live and function. And many people have lost their land. Uh, the land has been taken away, has been confiscated, and this occurred from the beginning of Oslo with the, with the approval of the Palestinian Authority, I might add, that lands were taken to build settlement roads, and eventually, you know, lands were taken, of course, Palestinian lands were taken to build the separation wall. And uh, this is what, you know, is meant by an archipelago. You have cantons and areas, and uh, people increasingly are living in these very you know, constricted areas because it is difficult for them to move. And in some cases, they are restricted for major parts of their own, you know, their own land in the West Bank. And um, uh, of course, there are massive restrictions on water use, the disproportionate use of water. Uh, I read a recent figure where Israeli settlers have 300 liters per capita compared to 70 liters per capita given to Palestinians. In some villages in the West Bank or towns in the West Bank, people don't have water for days. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a situation, this is what I mean by violence. It's a, a form of, occupation is a form of institutionalized violence against people. It's not just about uh, armed conflict. It's about the theft of land, the theft of water, uh, the destruction of homes, as I said, and and fundamentally, it's 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 eliminating the ability of people to work and take care for their of their families, to provide for their children, and to live an ordinary, normal life that all of us want, whether we live here in America or in Germany or in France or anywhere else. And this is the um, uh, this is the for me the greatest tragedy, and, and it's, it's a crime. It's an absolute crime to do this to, to human beings. And I don't understand, truly don't understand, um, what Israel feels they are accomplishing by doing this. Because these two people live together, and they live very closely together, and no amount of separation fundamentally is possible. You can build all the walls you want. You can build all the barriers you want and checkpoints. I believe there are almost 600 checkpoints now of varying kinds in the West Bank. Uh, you can cut off Gaza. You can isolate Gaza. But you're talking about areas that are tens of miles in distance from each other. So there's no amount of separation truly that's possible or sustainable over time. Um, Israelis live with Palestinians and Palestinians live with Israelis and these two peoples are destined to live together. And I don't understand what the Israeli government feels and successive Israeli governments have felt they are achieving um, by treating people in this manner. Um, this is a contest, despite what anybody will say, this is fundamentally a contest over territory. It's not a fight about religion, and hopefully it will never become that, because then it becomes truly intractable. It's a fight over land, and um, the unwillingness, fundamentally, of the Israeli government to share the land. For me, one of the saddest aspects of all this, too, is that most Israelis, my family included, who live in Israel, who I love dearly, who are wonderful, decent people, um, have no concept. They have absolutely no concept of what life is like for Palestinians just, you know, 30 or 40 miles down the road. Uh, they don't want to know. Uh, it's easier not to know. Um, and they have no real understanding, nor have they ever, in my view, had any real understanding of their own government's policies in these areas and what has been happening to Palestinians over time and certainly why it's been happening over time. Uh, and I truly believe that Israelis want peace. Uh, I truly believe that if they felt 
secure if they felt that they could reach, um, as a friend of mine said, a mutually unacceptable arrangement <laughs> with Palestinians, that people would opt for it. I don't believe, based on my experience with my family and my many friends in Israel, that people want to live in a state of insecurity. Um, but of course, the question is, how do you, after all these years, how do you get people to the point where they're prepared to trust? But I also feel that if Israelis had a better understanding of what is really happening inside the territories, truly what is happening, and what, what is the way in which Palestinians have been forced to live and the kinds of conditions that they are forced to endure, um, if there was a greater understanding and um, connection between people, I, I would like to believe, and I do believe, that there would be change for the better. But again, you know, Oslo, going back to Oslo and to the cantonization and, and uh, um, the whole archipelago issue, it is designed, too, to separate people from each other, to separate Israelis from Palestinians. And from the beginning of the occupation, the idea was never to integrate Palestinians into Israel or Israelis into the territories. The idea was to keep the population separate. But there was interaction. Worker, you had Palestinian workers entering Israel on a daily basis. Now, they would go home at night, okay, but they did enter. And there was interaction. And I witnessed it many, many times over these last two and a half decades or more. Um, but that ended. And there was very little interaction. And it ended effectively with Oslo, with the so-called peace process. The um, separation, not only uh, of the West Bank and Gaza, and, and also the, the sort of internal separation of people, but it also very much restricted and eventually ended interaction between Palestinians and Israelis. Now, you do have West Bankers entering Israel now to work. They work on settlements. They work inside Israel as well. Um, Gaza is completely cut off. Um, and in the past, historically, you had um, a huge percentage of Gaza's labor force working inside Israel. So the idea was to cut off any kind of human interaction between Palestinians and Israelis. And this has been very damaging, in my view, for both peoples. In 2006, Hamas was democratically elected. The US, EU, and other countries consider Hamas as a terrorist organization due to um, suicide bombings, rocket firings, and they also claim that Hamas wants to eliminate Israel. So what is your assessment of Hamas, its development since 2006, and how would you describe the organization in regard to a two-state settlement, which is on the table? One can only judge this organization on, on, um, on what, obviously, on what they do and, and on their willingness to engage. And they have made it very clear over time, arguably since 1988, um, that they are willing to talk and engage with Israel. So I can't sit here and tell you that engaging them will produce a positive outcome. But I can sit here and say that if we don't engage them, the outcome will, will not be a good one. And that one way to moderate or to, if the goal truly is a resolution of the conflict, Hamas is a, is a vital actor now. Whether we like it or not, it is a vital actor. It controls the Gaza Strip. And now, in the post-Arab Spring era, it arguably has a higher profile and more legitimacy regionally than does Fatah. Hamas looks at Fatah, the region looks at Fatah, sees all the concessions they have made to Israel, to the Americans, over time, and it has gotten them very little. In fact, the situation, as I've just spent the last few minutes describing, has declined, deteriorated dramatically. So remember, Hamas has that precedent. And 
they, are, they do not want to commit the same mistakes. That doesn't mean they're unwilling to compromise. It doesn't mean that they're unwilling to engage. It simply means that they, too, have red lines. But one way to, to test them, or to test their resolve, to test their seriousness, is to engage them. And when, when Islamists are brought engaged in that way, and when they are held accountable, not only um, by their own constituency, but by other constituencies, then they are often forced to moderate. Um, so for me, I think it is extremely important if people are truly um, serious about resolving this conflict, uh, Hamas has to be engaged. There can be no resolution to the conflict without Gaza. And there can be no Gaza today without including Hamas. It's as simple as that. When you now look to Germany declaring unconditional support for the state of Israel and at the same time is sending high-tech submarines which are capable of firing nuclear arms to Israel, what is your assessment of German policy toward Israel and the Israel-Palestine conflict? My feeling is that a true friend of Israel would be prepared to behave in what they consider to be the best interests of Israel. And in my view, the best interests of Israel is to ensure an end to this terrible conflict. And in order to ensure that, one has to confront the role that Israel plays in perpetuating that conflict. I, you know, everything I do and all the work I've done these many, many years is, of course, shaped and influenced by my personal history, by the fact that my parents were survivors of the Holocaust. They, both of them survived Auschwitz. My father was the first person to escape the death camp at Chelmna, which was the first extermination camp. And he was one of seven survivors. My mother survived the Lodge ghetto, the Litzmannstadt ghetto. I have a very long and, and uh, deep history with the Holocaust. And the Holocaust was a defining factor in my life. And it is because of that personal history and the values with which I was brought up, the Jewish values with which I was brought up, that I as a Jew feel I cannot possibly remain silent when, when other Jews are committing crimes in my name and trying to justify those criminal acts in my name. This is not, of course, the occupation is extremely damaging to Palestinians, but it is also damaging to Israelis. I don't want to see my cousins and their children grow up and live in a situation of insecurity and violence. I don't want them to grow up learning to hate Palestinians. I don't want my Palestinian friends growing up and their children growing up learning to hate Jews or Israelis. Uh, the occupation is a terrible thing. It is, as I've said, a criminal act against another people. And it is not in Israel's interest, putting morality aside for a moment, it is not in Israel's long-term interest to sustain this situation, a situation of oppression, dispossession, and criminality. And I don't understand how any person, and particularly any Jewish person, can justify this. If Germany, I understand the history, obviously, better than most. But as a Jew and as a child of survivors, and I can tell you that my mother felt very strongly about this as well, what is happening is simply wrong. It is wrong, it is immoral, it is criminal. And it cannot be allowed, should not be allowed, to continue. And uncritical support for Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians is immoral in my act, in my, in my view. It is immoral and it is criminal. And if Germany and any other country truly cares about Israel, they would challenge Israel on these policies on that basis as a friend, as a friend and supporter of Israel. It is important for Germans to speak out and to say, this is wrong. 
and this should end. And not only because it hurts Palestinians, because it will hurt you as well. It is, you know, it is in, incomprehensible to me how any human being can look at this situation, any human being who has any knowledge or understanding of the situation, and not speak out against it. I, I simply cannot understand that. And I can tell your viewers that in the United States, some of the most outspoken critics of Israeli policy are Jews. That the progressive Jewish community in the United States has grown dramatically in relative terms. When I started my work, there were very few of us in, in the Jewish community in America who spoke out critically about this. In the last 25 years or so, the numbers have grown dramatically to the point where we now have national organizations, local organizations speaking out. Um, we don't all agree on everything, but we agree on one basic premise, and that is that the occupation is wrong, it must end, it is immoral, and it is uh, uh, damaging for both peoples, and that uh, Jews cannot, should not, support the oppression of other people and the denial of their human rights, especially when it is occurring at the hands of other Jews and in our name. And this is where I stand. This is you know, where I come from. The fact that my parents survived Auschwitz and Chelmno and ghettos uh, is entirely consistent with what I do and why I do it. Of course, there are many Jewish people in this country who wouldn't agree with that and who would object to that. But for me, being a child of survivors, growing up with that personal history, having lost so many members of my family, people I never met, of course, um, to this horror, this horrific period of time, compels me even more to speak out against injustice wherever I see it, and especially when it's being, as I said, committed in my name. My parents, if they taught me anything in my life, they always constantly reiterated to me the importance of speaking out against injustice, the, the danger of remaining silent, the danger of standing by on the side and turning your head away and not seeing. Um, it, was, it was constantly emphasized to me that if you do not speak out against injustice, you become complicit in it. And my own parents lived their lives in that way. And they, you know, whether it was on smaller issues or larger issues, but they always spoke out against what they felt was wrong. And um, I feel Germans should do that. I feel Italians, Americans, French, any human being with any sense of conscience. It's not speaking against Israel, it's speaking, ultimately, it's speaking for Israel. Thanks a lot for the interview, Sarah Roy. Thank you.